Okay. Uh, while we are, everybody, everyone is joining, I'll tell a little bit about us, and what we do and why. So I'm Pavel Kravchenko, I'm the co-founder of Distribute Lab. We are partnering with InnoHub uh, in order to make the Futurism Forum in UAE and to like bring the best speakers and with the best experience to the audience and uh, cover the most interesting topics. So today our, our topic will be like the experience and the situation in Switzerland. Can we replicate the same in other locations? So we'll be asking Pavel Yakovlev a lot of questions about his experience because he was deeply involved in the ecosystem building, especially the blockchain ecosystem. That's how we know each other. And he invested in a lot of startups and I personally know some of them. So that's definitely will be an interesting topic. And in general, uh, we've done already a few more seminars about uh, like, um, FAT regulation, money transmission, and so on and so forth. So and there will be many more. And the conference, the Futurism Forum, is going to happen in the first week of June, July. So until then, we have to build and fully finalize the application, the ecosystem for the uh, conference participants. Because we've done many, as Distribute Lab, we've done many conferences offline, uh, but online is like something new for us. So, uh, and this one within the hub will be our first experience that's going to be cool. Okay, uh, Pavel, while we are, everyone is joining, let's briefly introduce yourself, please. Hi, how's it going? Good to see you, man. I think last time we saw each other was, um, did we see each other in yeah, Kiev or was it, yeah, was it yeah, in Switzerland? Yeah. yeah, at the Blockchain UA conference. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited. I saw a few of your previous streams. Um, so I think you're doing a great job and I think you, you guys are doing some of the better job in terms of getting some of the really exciting speakers together. So props for that. And I'm also looking forward to the time when we can finally travel and meet each other in person because I think that's going to be that's going to be next level. You know, some people say there's times BC, so before Corona and after Corona. So I'm really looking forward to the <laughs> times when we can meet each other in person. So um, a few words about myself. So um, Pavel Yakovlev, I've been in the blockchain scene for the past three years. Um, so my adventure began with helping out different startups uh, with their marketing and communication efforts because this is where I come from. Um, I used to work for large corporates, helping them um, with the communication side of things. Um, and then slowly I got into the startup scene. Uh, luckily, um, the blockchain startup scene was just across the train tracks from where I used to previously work. And slowly I got involved with CV Labs and I've been with CV Labs and CVVC. So CV Labs is a, a co-working space which is located in Zug, Switzerland in Vaduz Liechtenstein and also now in Dubai, in UAE. So there's, there's, there's that connection, um, which also, so the, the, the co-working space also hosts a blockchain incubator. And all of that is being powered by CVVC, which stands for Crypto Valley Venture Capital. And CVVC is, yeah, it's a venture capital company that with the only perspective to um, collect and manage funding from uh, other companies and private individuals on their behalf, traditional venture model um, with management fee and performance fee and then distributed that cash to the startups that CV Labs first finds for CVVC, scouts them, and then puts them through um, an incubation program, which effectively is a three month program um, in the heart of Switzerland and Zug. Um, and CV Labs has conducted already two uh, batches. Uh, CVVC invested in 26 companies and if everything goes well, and we will be out of the corona madness there will be a third batch in september and applications are open so 
whoever wants to join. If you got a great idea and you're building something on blockchain, by all means, um, join the incubator. Uh, you can go to cvvc.com and uh, you'll see you'll see things right away over there. Um, so, as I was working with CV Labs and CVC, it became more prominent that um, my main focus was on helping founders and projects attain more liquidity, whether it's at an early stage or a later stage. And for this specific reason, I've uh, recently joined Bitrix Global, which is um, a global offshoot of one of the oldest crypto exchanges that some of you may know, uh, Bitrex. So we serve all customers outside of the US and Bitrex brand as it is, it's just for the US customers. And what I'm doing uh, at Bitrex Global is obviously all of the marketing communications, but also talking to different teams uh, to help them list on the exchange and secure more liquidity. Okay. Okay. This is interesting. And and can you tell us a little bit more about the drug project of Switzerland on the startup like uh, uh, how it's, how it's different. different? Sorry, you were cutting off there. What is what is different? And look at whether winning. In the last, in the last uh, uh, like two, three, three years, years or so, people, people consider it moving to Switzerland mm -hmm. because, because of, of those reasons. reasons. And so, so, of course, so, course and you found, found Zoom so attractive. attractive. What, what is what so attractive? attractive? Why not Why build your command? Yep. Yeah. So, Zoom um, is, so if we look at the structure of Switzerland, so it has 26 different cantons. And the way that the, the tax um, regulation is set up, that each and every canton can decide its own uh, taxation brackets. And you, for example, as an individual, you are taxed on three levels. You're, you're taxed on a communal basis of so where you live at a specific town, and then you're taxed on the cantonal level, and then you're taxed on the federal level. Um, the cantonal one is, and, and the communal one are pretty much adjustable. That's on, the, on a you know, private level. As a company, you are taxed on a federal level and you're also taxed on the cantonal level. And with that in mind, a few of the different cantons have, uh, depending on their size and their requirements, can get into um, situations where for, for some companies, uh, it's more preferential to have a company in Canton A and for others in Canton B. So for example, um, Canton of Geneva <clears throat> and Geneva City as such is, is very favorable towards trading companies. Um, so much so that they have specific tax breaks and a lot of the larger um, trading companies are set up there. Uh, Zug predominantly has always been quite favorable in terms of taxation. Uh, so effective tax rate is around 7%. Um, and that has prompted a lot of companies to set up offices and headquarters there. Um, so it's not just the blockchain scene that somehow came to Zug. There's very big brands like um, Glencore, um, Johnson & Johnson, um, Iron Man, uh, they all have, um, Mervyn Pick, uh, Burger King, they all have um, headquarters in Zug. So obviously that helps. Uh, but I think what also helps is the fact that you can actually go and talk to the local municipality and you would be treated not as, um, you know, you would be treated very well you would be treated as a, as a client rather than as a subject that is being taxed. And I think this forward looking um, customer oriented setup is something that separates Zug from, from all other contents. But other contents have, have also caught up. 
So we're seeing a bit of a competition happening in terms of uh, taxation. Okay, so basically it's about uh, the um, like internal competition. Yeah. How cantons are trying to attract uh, these startups. And mm -hmm. do you see the like startups culture growing? And you know that for Silicon Valley, it was like a combination of military spendings and uh, education and then talent and then investment money, etc. Do you see something in there? Something similar? I think what has been created, and I'm a huge fan of the Silicon Valley, and I think what has been created there is, is something very unique. And I know a lot of startup hotspots have been trying to replicate that. But I think it's, it's very difficult simply because it's, it's almost like creation of life, right? There's, there's so many factors that are coming together and then you have some kind of a result. If you, if you think in systems, this is exactly what has happened there. I think when it comes to Switzerland and to Zug, uh, what's interesting to observe is on the research and academic level, pretty much all of the top universities have um, either a FinTech or blockchain um, or any type of startup lab that is there to one, push out research in a specific technology and B, help out some of the students to play around with some of their ideas, right? So University of Lucerne, which is quite close to University to, to Zug, um, has uh, design thinking as, as one of their most leading um, yeah, um, areas. And, and that kind of thinking trickles down uh, into the startup ecosystem. And then you look at University of Zurich, um, ETH, they have very strong blockchain centers. Um, you look at University of St. Gallen, same thing. So that's one factor. So you have universities. Then you have the government that is quite interested in the technology, in fintech and in blockchain. You also have <clears throat> um corporate interests uh, that have some types of innovation labs so they're all in a way are contributing to our creation and growth of the startup ecosystem and you as a startup founder you have a lot of ways where you can one get funding whether through private individuals and venture capital you can collaborate with different universities and then you can do uh, pilot projects with some of the corporates. Okay, and by the way, I know that you you were studying in Malta and Hong Kong. Like, uh, can you compare maybe a little bit with that jurisdictions because they also consider like, like blockchain friendly and fintech friendly. Um, I I think all ecosystems are quite different and yes you can have favorability to a specific uh, technology but then the way that the country is, is, is being set up maybe on the infrastructure level or on the way that um, once you get to a specific level and you need to scale then things could get potentially a tiny a little bit more difficult um, if we compare Switzerland to Malta I think it's it's not really a fair comparison. So Malta has been trying to achieve a lot on the uh, legislative side of things. So being one of the first countries to come up with uh, guidance on how to regulate digital assets. But then when it comes to startups, I think the scene is simply not there. Um, also, if you look at the blockchain uh, companies that went to Malta and, and tried to set up shop, a lot of them are leaving simply because the basic infrastructure is not there. Uh, you can have the right regulation, but if the banks are not equipped to do KYC and AML for a very exciting and new technology like blockchain, then you're in a bit of trouble. Uh, when it comes to Hong Kong, I think Asia deserves a very special attention. I think things that are happening there is very different to the things that are happening in Europe, I think um, over there, the perception of risk is very different to what we see in Europe. And therefore, what I have observed, at least in China, um, it's 
the fact that people are moving much faster and their regulation is, is not an obstacle. Where in Europe, we try to regulate things and make sure that um, consumers are protected. We know what we're dealing with. Uh, we're not going absolutely insane like they're doing in the US with regulation, but there's a bit of a middle ground. Then Asia is quite on the forefront in terms of technology and design thinking mentality in a way. But then when it comes to regulation, I think it's not being regarded as something that is, you know, uh, is necessary at this point. So more innovation, less regulation. And like, is it a benefit or like a problem for them? Like, especially in this world? If we go about discussing blockchain. For Asia. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of really exciting things are coming out of Asia. So um, more relaxed regulation is definitely helping them. Also, if you look at different exchanges, right? Some of the biggest exchanges are coming from Asia. Uh, and that's exciting. I, I think or the US. That, yeah, or US as well. But a lot of them, you know, Binance, OKX will be, um, they're all uh, coming out of China. And there's a lot of innovation happening. Um, so from that perspective, yes, definitely. And, I, and I, I'm still yet to find an ecosystem like Asia where people, and it's not just China, it's also uh, South Korea, it's, it's Taiwan, it's Vietnam, where people truly live um, the crypto way. Like it's, it's, it's slowly becoming part of the, their life, right? Because they've had great exposure to FinTech, they had Alipay, they had WeChat, they can understand seamless transactions, they can do a lot of the stuff which crypto now offers. And for them, it's not necessarily a novel technology. Plus the whole um, gambling culture is also helping, gamification. So all of those things that we're seeing in, in, in blockchain and in crypto, that's quite prominent over there, it's now considered to be part of the experience. Interesting. Okay. And um, what would you say about like in investment capacity mm -hmm. in Switzerland? Is it enough to make ecosystem really grow fast? Or money is still like conservative and like going only only into like established projects? How would you elaborate on that? So there are two parts to this. So part number one is there's a lot of um, corporate venturing. So if you look at things like um, SBB, which is which is the uh, transport provider. You look at Swiss Post. Um, you look at Swisscom, which is a telecoms provider, the the main one. Um, all of these major players, also obviously banks and and, and insurances, and financial service uh, providers. They all have quite a good um, war chest to play with in terms of investments and venturing. Um, they have specific, so for example, um, Swiss Post and Post Finance. These are the two kind of government organizations that have um, innovation labs with quite a sizable uh, amount of cash to deposit um, in, in different startups and invest. Um, and then if you look <clears throat> on more of a um, private investment capacity, um, you're also seeing a shift. So a few of the folks that have made successful exits, uh, entrepreneurs are bundling together and creating venture capital vehicles. So Tomahawk Ventures um, from one of the founders of Definity uh, launched, I think a couple of weeks uh, back. Uh, we're also, so three of the main um, startup folks uh, in the scene recently launched Wingman Ventures. Uh, you're also, we're also seeing a shift in uh, private banks and family offices that are creating specific allocations to alternative assets, which effectively, this is what venture capital is. And these allocations range from one to 2% to maybe 7% in their portfolio. So there's a, there's a 
appetite for more risk, but then that risk is somehow tampered into what stage of the startup would you want to invest? So I'm, I'm, I'm sure your viewers know that uh, the earlier you invest in a startup, the more risk you take on, but also potentially have bigger rewards in the end, if everything goes well and the startup that you've invested in succeeds and either does an AP, IPO in the next seven to 10 years or does a successful exit in five years plus. It's interesting that you mentioned Definity, mm -hmm. because I guess they're still not yet they reached the, any point of profits or it was just an ICO. They raised a lot of money though, but I, I don't think it's a um, good example of successful exit. Um, no, it's just the team, the core team is still there. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the co-founders exited Definity and has created his, um, his own venture capital firm, Tomahawk Ventures. Okay. But as far as I'm concerned, Definity is still going strong. I think they're actually expanding. There's more people, there's a lot of activity and yeah, let's see. Um, for us, it's one of the flagship projects that's coming out of Switzerland, so. Interesting, but Definity, I know Dominic who was the CEO and the co-founder, at least. Well, that's the same. They originally from Silicon Valley. Yeah. Interesting, because, you know, I haven't, just a side note, I haven't heard about them for a long time, and now you're making it up. So, probably in different ecosystems, like, uh, like it's information asymmetry. So, uh, some startups are considered cool in Silicon Valley, some startups are considered cool in Switzerland, and some in China, and then maybe sometimes they don't intersect. So, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, before we proceed, we have a question in the yeah. chat uh, from Ilya. And how is Crypto Valley project feel themselves now? I guess it's like in Corona situation. Yeah. Seems like this jurisdiction internal banks are pretty limited in terms of scaling of crypto projects. Um, so that's the question. And uh, also as comment from me, mm -hmm. uh, we all heard that um, Bitcoin Swiss is uh, just announced the round of raise. Yes. Something million uh, francs. Yeah. So a devaluation of 200 something million francs, mm -hmm. so which is kind of already big. And they plan to spend this money on actually buying the proper the bank license or even the bank. Mm -hmm. So can you like elaborate on both of these? Okay, let's start with Bitcoin Swiss. Um, I think what they're doing is great. I think the timing is right. I think as a six-year-old company that has been in the space for a while, and in fact, I truly consider them to be the pioneers of the Crypto Valley. Everything started with them. A lot of people think that it's due to Ethereum, which is somewhat true because Ethereum followed the next year. And Vitalik and his buddies had a, a place to stay in two and, and, and they built there for a few years. But I truly think that, that Bitcoin Swiss were the first ones, the pioneers. And after, for many, many years showing uh, positive returns and wanting to become much more than just a crypto broker, becoming a, a, a bank, I think this is the move in the right direction. Uh, from that perspective. And I think the valuation that they're coming up with, I, I, I actually would think it's quite a modest one, given everything that's been going on and the fact that they're surrendering, what is it, 20% of their equity. I think it's, it's, it's well justified. And I think they're half filled already um, in the race. So I wish them nothing but the best of luck. I think uh, the team is phenomenal. They have some of the best people. And it's a good combination of uh, techies, uh, crypto and blockchain. I wouldn't even call them enthusiasts anymore because they've been working in this for such a long time. So proper um, professionals and also folks from the financial services industry. Um, so Arthur, uh, the CEO is uh, coming from 30 plus years of, of uh, banking. So 
I think they're on the right track. The team is, is solid, their technology is great, um, their customer focus has been impeccable. So I'm very excited about this. And on to the question from Ilya I'm seeing over here. How is Crypto Valley projects feel about themselves now? It seems like this jurisdiction internal banks are, are pretty limited in terms of scaling of crypto projects. So there's 800 companies in the Crypto Valley, uh, more than that. And, and we, we know this because we keep track of all of them. There's a um, um, Crypto Valley directory, uh, a service that is being um, handled by CV Labs in terms of how they're doing right now. So obviously the larger ones are still doing quite well. So if we look at companies like For Art, uh, Utopia, if we look at uh, Seba, which is a crypto bank, if we look at Signum, um, Lika Business, um, also Lika Exchange, Dfinity, from that perspective, everything seems quite okay. How will this, um, how will the current crisis impact the smaller projects that yet to be seen? Um, again, we're still, every, every company that there is in, in crypto is, is still somewhat a startup. And the Bitcoin Swiss Series A raise is, you know, also a testament to the fact that it is still a startup. Um, in terms of limiting things, not so sure, because um, maybe you've heard of a gentleman called David Johnston from e Iman Capital. Um, yeah. So what he believes in is that Switzerland is exactly the right place to A, attract uh, great brains and techies from all over the world and predominantly in the, from the US. And this has been the case with Ethereum and B, it's also known by the Asian investors and therefore is capable of attracting additional capital to scale from Asia. And then in terms of finding your market, we live in a globalized world. Your market is the whole world. So I don't think you should be limiting yourself just to Switzerland as a market. Okay, I'm going to take it. How do you see the next trends? Is it more currency trading and price gambling or integration with traditional finance as alternative payment systems? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think both actually. So there's definitely going to be more trading. Uh, we're, we're seeing trading in, in crypto maturing. We're seeing futures coming. We're seeing all sorts of crazy things happening. So from that perspective, definitely more things are happening. And um, I, I know stories of, of uh, prop traders moving into crypto because, you know, and NFX traders moving into crypto simply because they didn't have enough volatility in their traditional markets. Maybe now the situation is different due to the fact that the markets are all over the place, traditional markets. Uh, so let's see what's going to happen. But from that perspective, I think we will see more, more of trading and we will see quite interesting and exotic uh, trading opportunities, ETFs, ETPs, ETNs, um, all sorts of different trackers, trackers being uh, you know, tracking different crypto baskets being launched on traditional exchanges and then issuing tokens that mirror that tracking and mirror that performance and being sold back to the exchanges. So all sorts of different, very interesting financial innovations will come in the coming years. I'm, I'm pretty positive on that. But in terms of the traditional finance integration, that is already happening. Um, so much so that yesterday we saw the news from JP Morgan Chase starting to bank um, it's Coinbase and Gemini, I want to say. So that integration is already happening. Um, the fact that Julius Baer, one of the prime um, private banks in Switzerland, have invested in SEBA specifically to understand what is happening with crypto and how they can integrate their service is already the fact that it's, you know, things are happening on the integration side of things. 
uh, Signum has released their um, stability mechanism or stable coin um, that will be used for settlement. Um, the protocol that we're seeing, the open bus protocol that is being championed by, uh, I think it's Bitcoin Swiss, Signum, Seba, and uh, Crypto Finance, if I'm not mistaken. So that already shows that there's a lot of work being done in integrating with traditional uh, finance providers. Okay. Uh, Pavel, I think I'm going to continue yeah. with questions or should we? Yeah, yeah, you can continue. Okay. I just sometimes have my internet not stable for some reason. No problem. Will yeah, my construction works? Yeah. The construction in the building and I have no electricity, so I'm sitting on my you know, data. Jesus. <laughs> just today. But building is good. I think the fact that there's building and construction is always a good sign. Yeah. Yeah, it's built already. But, uh, I have a short question before we proceed. Um, I recently heard some interview where I don't, I forget who told, who said that, but that's 90% of Crypto Valley startups would either go to government to ask for a bailout or just have to go out of business. So what, yes. how would you say this kind of, we say, we've heard that crypto is relatively like independent or traditional funds and mm -hmm. sustainable and now we see like oh that's kind of the same story we yeah to, uh, I, I hope we have we don't need to bail out bitcoin yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think there's a bit of a confusion okay. i think i think there's a bit of a confusion so what the swiss government has offered to all of its companies um is the ability to if you're affected by the Corona virus and, and you, your staff doesn't have the ability to work, you can go on partially on an unemployment um, insurance, I think is the right term. So once, once you, you work in Switzerland and you, you pay taxes, uh, you also pay this contribution uh, to the unemployment insurance. And then the government said, okay, let's, you know, it's a, it's a special situation. We understand that you, you're losing business. We understand that you won't be able to have events. You won't be able to travel to, to your business partners. You won't be able to sell for some time. If you want to keep your workforce and you don't want to let them go and you need some help with still paying them, remember we still have this insurance and we can activate this for a couple of months. So that has been the situation. As opposed to companies going to the government and saying, hey, we're drowning, like the airlines did, for example, and asking for bailouts. So I think it's more on the employee side of things, making sure that people don't lose valuable resources. Okay. Makes sense. We have a couple of questions. Yeah. Chat. First, maybe not very related to the topic of the webinar, but if you have your own opinion about the consolidation of mining power, what would you say? I am very far from mining. Um, that just has never been my focus. So I don't think I, I have an opinion, but it's a very topical question given um, we just passed the halving. So uh, will mining be even more consolidated than some decentralized entities now that Bitcoin block reward is halved? It's, I mean, basic understanding, right? So please don't, don't, don't crucify me. My understanding is you would require more resources to mine and therefore you would obviously see some kind of market consolidation. Right? Just simple logic. Um, what the reality will be, God knows, but we've had large mining operations already previously, right? So very big firms coming in and, and, and mining all sorts of different things. So I think that is just going to, that's, that's the trend that will continue. Okay, then the next question is like, we already, we already touched this. Mm -hmm. 
how deep do you think the blockchain will be integrated in a banking system in the next years? Something about reconciliation or payments or maybe some other things like logistics, trade finance? Yeah, I think logistics and trade finances are, are the two hot topics um, that are coming up, definitely. Um, remains to be seen how it will be integrated. Um, in terms of traditional fintech applications, uh, the fact that you can open up bank accounts uh, for blockchain companies, that's, I think, is already a win. The fact that you have fiat on-ramps and off-ramps with some of the banks in Liechtenstein, which is called, um, if you translate it literally from German, it, it's called uh, uh, the money rooms, right? Where you just come in, you do the purchase, and then that money is wired to an exchange. Uh, that's already, to me, that's, that's an integration. Um, settlement that I've mentioned already by Signum Bank, um, trackers that are being issued by, by SEBA, I think it's SEBA 1 is their first ETP. Um, that's already an integration. Um, what else that's interesting out there? Um, Amun has done quite interesting things um, with Swiss banks and also with the Swiss traditional exchange listing their ETP and ETNs. Um, yeah. Which banks do you recommend to ask open a bank account for Swiss crypto company and foundation? Um, I think if you want traditional banks, um, some of the forerunners would be uh, Bank Frick. Um, then the other one is uh, Falcon Bank. But then if you want to go proper crypto banks, uh, which are opening up bank accounts for, for crypto companies, it's obviously Seba and Signum. So these are the two banks that have built from the ground up with crypto in mind. They have the license and they can open bank accounts. Interesting. And what do you think the, this, the biggest obstacle um, for other banks uh, and companies to like serve crypto entrepreneurs? Is it uh, like NFL, KYC or maybe something else or just mindset? Mindset. I think so they just don't understand what it is or? No, I think they understand and I think they are afraid and it's, mm. it's, it's very difficult to comprehend something like um, how can, so the whole way that the banking intermediary system is set up, you basically, you, you, as you wire your cash from bank account A to bank account B, you go through multiple intermediary banks. And obviously you, everything is centralized and you pay small fees. So much so that these fees amount to a few trillion dollars every year. It's a, it's a massive industry. And then blockchain and crypto comes around and you're effectively thwarting this monopoly with the fact that you just don't need banks to transfer value anymore. So I think there's, there's still a bit of a shock. There is a, there's denial that on an emotional level, I think the banks are not ready. And you look at JP Morgan Chase, who did a 100, 180 degrees turn in just a matter of two years. Uh, you look at Goldman Sachs, who was, you know, um, uh, Jimmy Diamond was, was trashing Bitcoin and crypto and then issued a stable coin. So I think it's, it's, it's this cognitive dissonance that, that the banks are currently experiencing. On the technology level, if banks want to do something, they will do it quite fast because they have the capacity, they have the technology, they have the right people working for them. They can hire whoever they want and they can build things. It's the emotional component that I think they're just simply, they're not ready. Um, yeah, but it's an interesting development because what we see now uh, in like regulated jurisdictions is then they try to apply the model of account 
uh, to crypto and say, oh, please KYC yourself, please provide information about all your counterparties and then pay with crypto. And this kind of doesn't make any sense for the you know person who knows crypto because it presumes anonymity of accounts and so on and so forth. And basically uh, in anonymous cryptocurrencies like Monero or Zcash and those who will appear later, you can't even uh, notice the fact of the transaction. So, and there is no account and there is no way to, to verify that certain money is there or is not there. So how do you think the regulation and mentality will change when people realize it's not just for today, it's not just the uh, like something that some toy or it's just the future of accounting systems. Yeah, I think this is this is one of the biggest topics right now, right? And, and I think with Zcash, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you can switch privacy on and off. But I think with with Monero, you cannot. It's just a privacy coin, and that's it. It's just you know. I mean, I'm, the, I'm saying that the technology is there, so yeah, it's like. Um, some people think, I think it's again, it's a mental mentality thing, mm -hmm. is that there is a new asset class, but the foundation uh, remains, in their opinion, the same. It's like you have a client, you file some paperwork, and then trade this new asset class. Yes. But here's the thing, that this new asset class comes with the infrastructure that assumes completely different foundation. So the, that you as a person responsible for your keys, and that everything could be anonymous and it, nobody can audit your transactions except you. So it just becomes not a new asset class, it's just eating the infrastructure itself. Yeah. So, like this is the most interesting part of this thing. Exactly, and this is what is causing the, the, the cognitive dissonance, is the fact that you need to throw away everything that you've known and you need to adapt to something that you don't necessarily understand. But, um, and it also, something that, for example, Switzerland has been fighting with for a very long time is um, privacy, mm -hmm. right? Everybody knows Switzerland has been very on, you know, on the side of its customers in terms of banking. It has been uh, very diligent in maintaining the privacy of its clients up until the time where regulators from other countries have effectively broke the banking privacy laws in Switzerland. So after all this extensive work that has been done to destroy the privacy in Switzerland uh, through different litigations and, and, and fines from other regulators, now we're in a situation where we need to revisit you know, the privacy. And I think in a lot of these situations, what you see with banks is most of the processes are being applied in a uh, simple, we got to make sure that we are compliant. And then how that compliance is then applied on a technical level, that remains to be seen. Okay, let's answer to the question to the chat and then I have another question. <laughs> I know a philosophical one, I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, from experience, I found out this is um, AI3, that sounds like uh, Elon Musk's baby. I'm sure everybody's seen the name. Uh, from experience, I found out that accepting crypto's payments is the best way of acquiring them. The second best is being a payment processor, the third best is being a broker. Is it appropriate to say that crypto is not for everyone? Cedric Abu Dhabi. Um, crypto is not for everyone. That's a difficult question. We obviously, as, as you know, I consider myself a, a, a crypto fan, not, not a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, it, I personally would think we could all benefit from efficiencies that crypto brings in terms of um, decreased transaction fees, speed, uh, in some situations, transparency, uh, traceability. Um, so, I would want to see everyone, even more importantly, in countries that don't have a banking infrastructure. Uh, that banking infrastructure is underdeveloped and most probably it doesn't have the resources to get that banking infrastructure developed in the first place. Uh, remittance payments. 
I, I think it's a massive use case for that. I think it's, it's, it's phenomenal what can be achieved if we spend more time educating people and work with traditional industry and regulators on making sure that people understand the benefits of this technology. Okay, uh, so my question to you is like, how do you think DeFi is affecting the finance? Because it's, uh, if we talk about stable coins and people, okay, people got used to the thought that, okay, it's a regulated bank, like Tether, and they print in money, <clears throat> or it's talking them somewhere, but DeFi is like not printing money. It's just a new model where you have the asset, which is virtual, and you kind of create a real asset out of the virtual asset. And it's kind of, and technically you can put in the collateral any asset, game currencies and game objects, and rep maybe some whatever tradable reputation points, etc. then create dollars. And this is like blows the mind of many people because they used to the thought that you put dollars in like reserves and you can print more dollars. And that's called, uh, like quantitative easing. Reserve banking. quantitative easing it's called yeah yeah, yeah. No, fractional reserve banking and now you can have similar model but with algorithm that leaves no word and has no like uh, enterprise behind it um, it may not have an, any enterprise behind it so how do you see these developments to affect financial industry I can tell you one thing from, from our personal experience um, as, as Bittrex and Bittrex Global, everything that has to do with DeFi on the US side of things, we're simply not touching for regulatory purposes. Um, I think it's, it's, from the technological perspective, it's absolutely incredible what can be done. From the compliance and the regulatory perspective is going to be a nightmare from the overall perception and, 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 and the acceptance and understanding, um, that's, I think it's going to be even worse because people, it's, uh, it's very scary what you can actually create with, um, with new, new technologies. And I don't think that people in general are ready for this. I don't think the traditional industry is ready. I don't think the regulators have even faint understanding of, of what's coming and it is coming. Uh, you know, technology, and this is why I, I consider myself a, a technologist and, and I absolutely adore everything, uh, all of the new uh, things that are coming out, all of the innovations, is simply because technology doesn't care, right? It doesn't have feelings. It, it, it cannot be stopped. You can regulate it into a corner, but then it will be adopted somewhere else. And it, it doesn't care about anybody's feelings. It doesn't care about uh, other people's you know, fears or anything. It's, 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 there's, there's a philosophical component to this, right? It's, it's, it's very true and it's happening, whether you like it or not, whether you have an opinion about it or not. So my message would be, I think everybody who, will be affected by developments in uh, decentralized finance, need to catch up, need to catch up fast. Yeah, indeed. And those who will catch up faster will then build <clears throat> something much more viable and competitive. Okay, um, I think uh, it's uh, done for me okay. uh, for today. Maybe if you have more questions from the audience. Uh, that was really interesting to hear your thoughts and like because you you have a 3D opinion uh, looking at Switzerland, Hong Kong, Malta and you can US obviously and uh, have having this good connection to Ukrainian entrepreneurs yeah. like landscape so you have very good touch base so it was really helpful and for me. Yeah. I, I also come from um, from Eastern Europe, so I'm from Estonia, and uh, I think Eastern Europe in general, so Ukraine, uh, Poland, the Baltic states, all of those places, they, uh, Belarus, they, they hold a special place in, in, in my heart. So if, if, you're, if you're thinking with a, 
about any specific idea, and this is maybe for the audience, is if, if you're playing around with different things, um, please, by, by all means, um, connect with me uh, on LinkedIn, let's talk. If you're looking for funding in Europe, if you're looking at different incubators, if you're looking at anything and you want to grow your idea and you want to develop yourself and you want to build great things and you cannot sleep at night because of that persistent idea, I'd really encourage you to come and talk to me. I'd be very excited to help you. I think um, Eastern European brains as such are um, very unique, phenomenal, and combined with grit and certain level of um, ability to build despite everything that's happening is truly unique. So I, I've been pleasantly surprised by many, many startups out of Eastern Europe, and I'd be very happy to help whoever needs that help and, and see if I can you know, guide you on the way to scaling and securing more finance and just growing. This is a very good offer. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Yeah. So thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah. Cheers. Bye.